What I do, I write for the BBC News website. That's, that's my, my day job. Um, and part of that has been of watching the rise of these things called MOOCs, massive open online courses with which you, you know, you, you'll all be familiar. Um, and the reason I call this after the hype is that, that I wanted to look at how far we've come on, on the MOOC story. Uh, and I think to an extent, it has come to the point where it is now after the hype, this is the technology hangover, the backlash is here, people are slightly uh, skeptical now about the value of MOOCs. Will they really, 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 really do all the things they're going to do? And in honor of such a sort of techie title, uh, I've decided not to use any technology at all. Um, and so rather than, the, rather than the sort of traditional labored PowerPoint, uh, this is my PowerPoint. Uh, and I'm afraid all the pictures, which would have been with the PowerPoint, I'm afraid you have to imagine yourselves. So you have to use that sort of virtual technology of creativity. The good thing is there are only 10 pretend slides. So if you start to tire, <laughs> there are only a few more left. But we'll do it slide by slide, but these are now imaginary PowerPoint slides. So this is something of an experiment. If you can imagine the first slide, click the imagine, the button would be here if I had a proper PowerPoint display. And coming towards you is going to be a picture, like in an old black and white film, of a newspaper front cover. Do you know the way they used to spin around? You know, Wall Street crash, someone murdered, St. Valentine's Day massacre or something. And gradually you can see the headline appearing on the front of the, of the, the front cover. Now there's a copy of the New York Times, and it says, the year of the MOOC, and we're in November 2012. This was year zero for MOOCs. They were going to take over the world, and everyone believed that the sort of uh, change that was brought to other industries by digital technology would, have, would, would eventually arrive at education. People knew that shopping had changed, banking had changed, entertainment had changed, news had changed. All these things had collided with the internet and been transformed. But education, particularly universities, even though universities like to talk a lot about change, actually they don't change that much. They're wonderfully resilient at, at absorbing uh, the prospect of change and not changing at all. Um, and people thought, now this was really, really, really going to happen. That, that, that article about the year of the MOOC uh, had, a, had a great stat saying that 1.7 million people had signed up to Coursera, which is the, the big MOOC platform that's come out of Stanford University uh, in California. And the selling point was that people were signing up to Coursera more quickly than to Facebook. So MOOCs were going to be the, the, the Facebook of, of higher education. But I think what really happened is that there's this, I think you come across the law called Amara's Law. Uh, and that says that technology, the impact of technology is always uh, exaggerated in the short term, but it's always underestimated in the long term. And I think that's what's happened. I think that, that we were very excited in 2012 by the prospect of 1.7 million people belonging to a MOOC. And I know Coursera is now something like 13 million people who have signed up to courses uh, through them. And no one's interested. It's, it's that peculiar process where the big changes that I think are happening now are going undetected. Uh, and while we say uh, that MOOCs have sort of come and gone, I think that actually the real traction is going to come in the next few years. Uh, and I do think that they will be um, tra transformative and they will not necessarily come out the other side as we expected. But I think so far we've had this rather strange three years uh, of, a, of a sort of phony war. So anyway, slide two, spinning towards you now. You have to imagine a picture of a, a funeral. Just to cheer you up. Um, you know, you can imagine you know, a hearse maybe or a... I don't know, one of those horse-drawn numbers with, with black horses and a plume on the top, and you know, sort of gangster style. Apologies to any members of the gangster community who might be here, but you know, that sort of stereotypical funeral. Um, and keep that thought for a second. Imagine the funeral up here. All I found covering technology and education as a news story, there is always a cycle uh, that has followed. It always begins with a sort of naive. Uh, excitement about it, a certain sort of, um, you know, thrill of the new, and it doesn't, doesn't matter what it is. When, when the internet was still young, you'd have newspaper articles showing that people had a website. Um, the royal family has a website, it's a story in itself. 
um, Obama sends a tweet, that's a story, um, then it'll be so many millions of texts sent on New Year's Day, so that all these things become stories themselves. Gradually we get bored of that, and we say, well, you know, so what, everyone texts, everyone's got internet, everyone's uh, using online technology for learning, everyone has a MOOC. And I think that sort of thing, we've come through that rather quickly. And we've reached the stage now where MOOC stories have to be quite exciting. It, it would be um, to do with a disease. There was, a, there was an Ebola MOOC that got a bit of interest. Um, and the reason we have the hearse in the visual virtual PowerPoint thing is because last week I had an email from someone saying that they had a MOOC for undertakers. And it was um, the idea that you could learn all the skills of the undertaking trade by following an online course. And I thought that had actually reached the full circle of, of this sort of techno journalism uh, story. So I think we've reached that point where we're now doing stories about, about coffins and moots. Slide three, if you're still with me, any of you? Slide three is a picture of Coventry. Um, could be Coventry Cathedral, perhaps, burnt out. That big tapestry thing inside. Maybe the specials, singing Ghost Town from a few years ago. Maybe an old newsreel where they call it uh, Coventry. I don't know if in old films. Or Warwick is another pronunciation for Coventry in higher education. The, um, the reason I mentioned Coventry is because, according to Wikipedia, which as we all know is absolutely true, uh, it has a population of 317,000 people, which is quite a big number, 317,000 people. A story recently showed that a single MOOC course uh, run by the British Council teaching English had 370,000 people, I think, taking it. That passed almost without notice. You know, one course, one course teaching English to people all over the world I think the bulk of whom were, were in the Middle East, actually, and that was the biggest single market. But if you sort of think about that, we stop being impressed by that. And that's an extraordinary thing to think that 317,000 people around the world consider a single cause. Uh, last summer, when UCAS managed to place half a million people in one year, this was hailed as a you know, remarkable thing. Half a million people going to university. That's every university in the UK took that in uh, as, as the UCAS. Uh, um, awarding a places last year, but one course had 350,000. And I suspect if we came back in a couple of years' time, that would sound tiny, and that would people with a million people, you know, I don't know what it will be. But that is very big, and I think where that goes, I think we're not quite sure, because that puts the scale of what we think of being a class now into, into a whole new world. Come the summer, there'll be people in various university departments trying to get together 30 people for a course, and worrying about its viability if they don't get that. All those people are out there somewhere wanting to do a course. And also, it wasn't run by a university. It was on the Future Learn platform, which is sort of, as you'll know, to do with the Open University and has partners in lots of UK universities. It was the British Council that put it together. You know, who is, who is the owner of that? What, are they a higher education institution? Sort of, but um, I think that's very, very, very thought-provoking. Fourth slide. If you can imagine now a um, picture of monkeys communicating with each other, lots of, in a zoo maybe, lots of sort of chatty chimpanzee photos, PG tip style if you want to, or just people, you know those sort of things with speech bubbles. And the reason <laughs> there's a picture of monkeys talking is because I think we don't, we can't stop communicating. I think we are compulsive communicators. And I think in education, it is rooted in communication in a way that we don't, we haven't really realised. MOOCs thought you could all learn alone and that somehow we could be in our own bedrooms and follow courses. And I think that the experience of the last few years has been that, that isn't true. And that an inherent part of learning is the, the collective experience of finding something out. That might be obvious to us in some ways, but there was an idea a few years ago that you could retreat into a, into, a, into a cell and learn at your laptop. It would be the university at the laptop, 
Um, and I think that the whole process of the last few years has been about finding out that's not really true and needing to find ways to bring the, tr the two together. Blended learning gets talked about quite cheerfully, but I don't think people have really worked out what the balance should be. I think there's a big gap there. Coursera has started to build um, colleges, effectively, around the world where people come together. They've, they've made the whole virtual learning thing come full circle, where you actually have places where people collaborate, come together to learn virtually. And if you ever go to somewhere like the British Library, it's full of people who are doing MOOC courses, and they're able to meet each other, and they, they, they team up, and they gather at a particular time in a particular part of the library and study together. And I think it's a bit like the way that libraries have, have survived and actually prospered when people thought they might not. And university libraries have had, a, have had a strange renaissance, I think, recently. They've really, they've really uh, found a new niche. And I was talking to a librarian uh, at a university now where the university is open all, all 24 hours a day full of people who are using laptops um, and her phrase for it was that people wanted to study alone together and I think there's something in that with MOOCs too that we, we sort of even if you want to study alone you still want to do it together and I think that's part of going to be part of where the MOOC goes to um, and I think that's one of those great sort of dot 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 things we are compulsive communicators and universities trying to create virtual courses that still need to build in that social networking, that physical content, that contact, and that, that, that sort of organic sharing of ideas. And I think that's something that will be the next part of the next wave. Slide five. Whenever you have PowerPoint, you're never very far away from clip art of, of some kind. Uh, it's one of the, the occupational hazards also of conferences that. that um, um, they often come from photo libraries, uh, and newspapers and, and websites are the same. And it's quite odd when you put in terms, you're searching for a picture to illustrate a story. You put in your term, and if you put in something to do with university and money, you often get a picture of uh, a piggy bank wearing a mortarboard. So if you can imagine now on the, on the virtual board, a picture of a, a pink piggy bank piggy bank with a little black mortarboard, which for some reason has remained as an irritating insignia for universities. So here we are, that's there. So why is that there? That's there because the whole MOOC story, I think, began in America, not by accident, but because of two key drivers, which are both ultimately economic drivers. And I think that will be where things are ultimately driven from. Um, the two key drivers in America at the time were um, an awareness that universities were getting very, very, very expensive. Costs were going up and up and up. The federal government didn't want to pay out any more for it. Parents didn't want to pay for their students. Students didn't want to have these massive debts. It was a sense this is getting crazy, crazily expensive. Got to do something about it. The other key driver facing universities still, but particularly a few years ago in the States, was about access. You have this growing, growing demand, more people want to go to university, more people want places, up against this wall of cost. And MOOCs were a sort of magic bullet, because at a stroke it raised the prospect of affordability and almost universal access. It didn't cost you anything if you were the recipient, there was no limit to class sizes. And I think We've rather sort of fancified the subject since, uh, and MOOCs have taken on a, on a little life of their own as promotional vehicles by universities and recruitment tools. But the key drivers were the, the piggy bank with the waterboard. It was about money, cost of higher education. And I think in the end, in, in the UK, the question of cost is going to keep coming back. What do you get for your money? How much is it worth? Contact hours. These are things which will come up. Universities ministers, after a while, will do the tours of vice chancellors and they'll listen to people again. How much do you get for your 9,000? How much more can you charge? What's the cost? And MOOCs, at their heart, are about a relationship between uh, time, money, your expertise, universities, what they offer. 
Um, and I think we always risk losing the, the, the hard reality of, of what MOOCs are. And I think that's why they won't go away. I think they will become more important um, as a, a, an affordable way of reaching a lot of people. What form that will take, I don't know. But, it, but that will be, I think, a crucial part of the equation. And I think that will come back to haunt us again. And I think it will create an industry of its own. It will change, change your industry too. <coughs> Sorry. Um, but it will happen. So we put away the, the piggy bank, the mortar board, and get out a sixth uh, slide. And that's going to be a picture of one of those old fashioned phones that you get in Downson Abbey or upstairs, downstairs, that sit in the hall with a bit of a funny old receiver on the end of it. Um, the reason that phone is there and that slide is because technology doesn't always turn out the way we expect it. And when the phone was first proposed, people thought there was no money in people just talking to each other. That was absurd. Why would you pay to chat to somebody? Why would you spend money buying a bit of kit and just let you talk to the person next door? That's stupid. No one would do that. You know, whilst you would write to them if you wanted to. Why would you do that? People thought the phone would be a form of broadcasting. People thought you'd have the, the receiver, you know, you'd have the thing at one end listening to an orchestra or something and everyone else would be gathered in a room uh, hearing what was being broadcast. Of course, that, that was completely wrong. And I think we should always bear in mind that our conceptions of what things will be will like to be changed. Um, and I think with MOOCs also, we, we've, because it was driven by people like Harvard uh, and MIT and Stanford, we think it's going to be a higher education uh, thing forever. I'm not sure it will. I suspect a lot of MOOCs will grow around professional qualifications, things that work at scale, massive uh, uh, qualifications taken by a lot of people where the same course will serve. Um, schools, if you think about something like an A-level or GCSE, that gets to a lot of people who are doing more or less the same thing. That's not always true at universities. Uh, there are some elements which are replicable, but it's not always true. And I think that's quite a thing to think about. A bit like the course being run by the British Council uh, that got all those people signing up. It wasn't a university. And I think that the challenge for universities will be to keep part of that market. I don't think they will necessarily dominate it. Um, I think it will be a huge, big space. I think it will be a huge uh, economic challenge not to be part of that. I don't know that universities are going to be in the driving seat always. They are now because they invented it. It's their gig. It's their, you know, it's their baby. But so was the internet, actually, if you remember about 20 years ago. You know, the, the academics owned the internet with the army and a few other people. But it was, came out of higher education. You know, did universities gain the most out of it, or did, you know, did Amazon and Google? And I think MOOCs will be the same. I think there'll be a tremendous amount of pressure from other, maybe non-traditional organizations, non-educational organizations, who will see it as a very lucrative space. Uh, and I think the partnerships that emerge within higher education, within further education, within the school sector, within publishing, within the public sector, within the private sector, will, will have a different landscape. I think it's, the moment now, you've had a free run of it for three years. It won't be the case, I think, maybe later on. And if you think of things like Khan Academy, I don't know if you've come across that in the States, which is a math tutoring thing, which is now phenomenally valuable as an entity, which has a vast reach. And it's essentially a, um, a series of videos teaching maths, quite low tech in many ways. But someone grabbed it, got a brand. It's something that can be reproduced at scale, which is the key to these things, I think. It can be used internationally as well as within the domestic market. Um, and I think that the, the idea that higher education has a monopoly on, on MOOCs or that sort of online learning, I think will prove to be false. Uh, and we might look back in a few years and say, you know, why didn't universities really grab that properly and then exploit it. Slide number seven. Heading towards the home straight. The picture is a for sale sign. Big for sale sign. Maybe tumbleweeds blowing through an empty property, dust everywhere. And this is about the fact that a few years ago, universities were obsessed with setting up bases overseas. 
campuses were going to be blossoming in China and Malaysia and Singapore, and everyone was going to have a, a, an offshore base. The brand of individual, individual universities was going to be shared, it was going to be a big thing, everyone was going to get lots of money out of overseas students. But as we all know, that didn't quite happen. Uh, and setting up overseas proved to be complicated, expensive, reputationally quite risky. I saw last week a piece about Singapore showing how many universities that have opened which have since shut. Some American ones, um, which had a lot of investment, didn't work out. New York University, massive. Powerhouse shut down one of its universities, other ones that were closed are moving away from there. That wasn't quite the narrative we all bought into a few years ago. Everyone thought that every university in the UK would spawn little colonies overseas which would bring in overseas students, overseas money, it would be a subsidy. I think MOOCs will have a lot to say about that. I, th I think that the fact that you can now teach people in other countries without them having the trouble and expense of coming here or you having to go over there and build buildings for them will be very, very important. And Stanford University, which is one of the, 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 I suppose one of the, the builders of MOOCs in the first place, um, are running a project now where they're not setting up overseas branches, branch campuses. They're going on tour. They're taking, it's like a rock and roll tour, going around the world with courses, which they sell, uh, I think it's 10,000 10, quid for about a couple of months. And you sign up, but you do it in London, or you do it in Singapore, or Delhi, or Shanghai. But a lot of it's delivered through uh, video, effectively. They won't say it's video because they want it to be much more high tech. But it's, it's a sort of interactive exchange. It's a sort of video, video conferencing with, with, with uh, a lot of fancy bits added on. It's, it's online and it's video conferencing, and it's the sort of and they use recorded materials. And you can see how the MOOC could very easily serve that market. If you have a very big, powerful brand, or you want to have a big, powerful brand, to go somewhere else and deliver a course without the trouble of having to build a building, without having the trouble or expense of all the risks that come with it. I can really see that being a very lightweight way of trying something out. The investment is, 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 is not as vast. You can pull back again. It's not all year. It might be a couple of months somewhere and then come back again. But it all depends on a library of MOOCs effectively. And I think what is now we talk about this as if these are little capsules being sent out into the ether. I think they will become part of teaching and they will use staff from one country to teach in another. And I think that is already beginning, but I think that will be part of this migration. And it won't be so much um, a brave new world as borrowing parts of the old world and, and cannibalizing it and exporting it. I think that will be a much more real thing. And I think that again has big implications. Um, I think for ambitious universities that want big audiences quickly, I think that will become uh, a very, um, very tempting offer. Slide 8 is uh, a picture of uh, a phone book, which now in some way is rather like old technology. I don't, do people have, have phone books still? I used to have very big phone books. Uh, and the reason this picture of a phone book is because they're full of names. Uh, and I was thinking there must be there must be a better name than a MOOC, which is such an ugly word. And, you know, outside of higher education, it doesn't have any great, it doesn't reach people, I don't think. And I think that will be something. Online learning, is it that? What is a MOOC? Why, why do we need this word? I think that's another challenge for higher education and publishers and other people to decide what this thing is. And I think the names people give things are, important and I think that that will be another bit of reinvention and I, I don't know if it's too late. I've talked to some people who, who deliver MOOCs who themselves have this conversation because if they say, some people say, well, what is this thing? I've never heard of it. It sounds stupid. It sounds a stupid word. And then they call it something else. Some people say, well, do you mean a MOOC? And so they're, they're sort of caught between this half-known, half-unknown state. Um, 
So I think that will be another question. They might re-emerge. So in a way, a MOOC is a rebranded open, sort of online course. Online courses existed before them. Um, I think that would be another story, I think. And it might be that they, they reinvent themselves by reinventing the name. They might emerge reborn, but looking rather similar, but with a different title. Slide nine. This is going to be um, moody, black and white, cop picture. So I was thinking about the wire, maybe even the, the wire. The wire with the wire, Baltimore, quite grainy, people being shot everywhere. Um, and the key theme with all those things is the idea that in the end, always follow the money. Money isn't everything, but follow the money if you want to see where things are really going. Um, and with online learning, you have lots of traffic, you have millions and millions of people using these things, and they're sold as being millions of people who want to learn something. That's a good thing, people want to learn something. They don't want to pay to learn. That's not so good. We need to take money off them. How's it going to work? And that's where things will happen. And I don't think necessarily that the current model, which to a large extent is a sort of hobby model. You, you might be doing another course, a lot of people who do MOOCs are actually already students somewhere else. Um, and they sort of, you know, do one thing and they dip their toe in something else because it's free. Now that is an audience which is valuable. But I think what happens is that, 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 that traffic on the internet is a bit like water in a field, you know. Eventually something grows and that becomes a crop. And, and it might be something like, in the end, it becomes a way of uh, selling recruitment advertising. It might be a way of actually recruiting people. MOOCs might become part of the what is a very lucrative recruitment industry. I know quite a few of the MOOCs have talked around that, but they actually will become the way of drawing together students who are clever and showing they're interested in something, and employers who are looking for people who are clever and interested in their area. And it's a sort of a meeting point. Um, these things are important. I mean, Twitter has been in the news the last few weeks. Everyone uses Twitter. No one pays for Twitter. Twitter loses money. What's it going to do? It will change. Um, will MOOCs have advertising? You know, maybe it will have work really, but a Google advertising, who knows? But what allows it to make money will become what it becomes. And I think that that will be an important issue because higher education and higher education funding are inextricably bound together. All your jobs depend upon it. Universities' futures depend upon it. And if MOOCs offer an opportunity for some people to make a lot of money, then someone else might not. And I think there will be a the cake isn't vast. You know, eventually someone will lose a slice. Um, and it might be the universities themselves change. But the Harvard uh, experiment has been with a bit like Russian dolls, where they have what they call MOOCs for the many. We have a course where anybody can do uh, can do a, can follow a course. It's free, but you don't get any help from anybody with it. They've also developed a thing called a Spock, which is a, a, a small private online course. And so, while you might um, have done it for free, you might pay a few dollars, and then effectively have access to the course materials. You'd be buying to it and you pay a little bit. You don't have a full degree, but you maybe have some of the teaching. And once you go down that road, you can see it becomes almost like a sort of metered process of how much you get. Uh, and that'll be related to how much you put in financially. The great opportunity there is the sheer scale. Uh, and talking to people at Harvard about it, they have top brainy people talking. But if it's in a room that can only take 50 people, you know, what a crazy way of doing anything open that up to half a million people if it's the same thing. Um, so the opportunity is there. Also, there's the risk, because the thing you're selling is, is, it's, it, is it's inaccessibility in some ways. It's, it's uniqueness and remoteness is what you, it's the cachet as well. So it's a very difficult balancing act for how much you choose to reveal. Um, I think I think that, that's, that, that is, and we should sort of, <laughs> there's a moment to ponder where that goes. 
But it leads on to the final slide of this pretend inaugural pretend PowerPoint display, which is the people throwing their hats in the air, celebrating. Like those irritating graduation pictures that full of people sort of getting there, whooping, as many of you will be later I expect, and cheering and making some rather happy noises. I think that the key with all this will be how far universities can go to get to that graduation moment through MOOCs. I think at the moment there's a sort of testing the water thing where you want to use it as a bit of a shop window, a way of putting your name out there, uh, a way of wanting to be part of the future but without losing too much of the past, wanting to sort of show your wares but without giving them away, selling a little bit without giving away the whole shop. And I think that the internet never works with that. I think that always fails. And I think there is an, either you don't do it and you say, we don't bother with that, and we do advertising, and we use uh, MOOCs as a sort of online prospectus uh, with a little tiny bit of content as a teaser, or else you go the whole way. And eventually somebody will make an absolute killing by offering uh, full online credit-bearing courses from reputable, uh, prestigious universities. And I think um, you can do online courses now. You can, you, can, you can get degrees, you can get online whatever. Particularly a master's, that's coming in particular as well. But you can also get online undergraduate degrees, but not in a way that is from sort of mainstream courses, mainstream universities, um, serving a, a global audience. And I think there's a nervousness about going down that road. And lots of American universities are sort of, they're trying, they're just about, they're sort of working towards it. And, and if you, you sort of think they've done it, but they don't really. And they tend to retreat into little bits of credit towards something else. But I think that is the, where it always must end, because you have to have the full thing. I think if anyone remembers when the internet was a bit younger, sometimes some of the failed uh, cul-de-sacs and dead ends were where businesses tried to use the internet as a way of showing you something. But if you wanted to buy it, you had to go to the shop, or you, you know, they offered you a, a, a loan. I remember people, there, were, there were financial companies that offered uh, loans and, and bank and mortgages and whatever. But you wouldn't get them from the website, then you had to go somewhere else. That always fails. You have to have the whole thing there. And I think the risk is great for universities because, you know, in some ways you risk diluting it, you risk it being turning into something which is very hard to accredit. How do you test people? How do you actually prove it's them taking the qualification? How do you prove that they're not cheating? How do you know that they're not people who are going to misrepresent what you've done? How do you know whatever? All those questions are there and, and remain to be challenged to be taken up. But someone will get there, someone will do it. And I suspect it won't be the big brands who have the most to lose. They, 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 they don't need to change, they have the most to lose if they get taken over by this. I suspect some ambitious universities who want to break out of that sort of dead hand of rankings uh, and the academic pecking order, we'll see that they can actually reinvent themselves. And somebody somewhere will make, I think we'll go for it, and we'll do very, very well. Um, and I think then that will throw down the gauntlet to the entire higher education system. Because if, for instance, you can get a good degree from a good American university for a couple of grads, what does that mean to a, to a university up the road that's offering something maybe you know similar in terms of reputation-wise for nine grand a year. That will be a little explosion thrown into the market, and I don't know if people. I don't know where you know people know where those pieces will land. I think it's a very real thing. At the moment, we're in a bit of a false. We're, we're playing with it. You know, looked at it. We, we, you, can, you can have hundreds and hundreds of different moves. Future learn. EdX, Coursera, Udacity, they're all, all offering. But I think when someone actually offers a full, proper degree in a big subject and can show that they can deliver it uh, in a form that represents good quality and good value, I think that will be a very important moment. 
And I think, the, going back to the first slide of the year of the MOOC, I think that was when the year of the MOOC really begins.